Welcome everyone to We Still Demand, the past, present, and future of 2SLGBTQIA plus activism. We'll be starting now. We're expecting hopefully a few more people to be trickling in, but to try to keep the time, we'll, we'll get started with things um, now. So uh, I'll be your moderator today, and we'll be starting off this conversation first with a land acknowledgement, then a quick snapshot of We Demand, some introductions, and then finally a bit of logistical information before diving in and hearing our panelists speak. My name is Emma Awe, my pronouns are she, they, and I work as a community coordinator and research assistant at the Canadian Centre for Gender and Sexual Diversity. I'm also a PhD student at Carleton University, researching how queer feminists and racialized communities have used media, art, and literature as cultural tools of resistance. Both the CCGSD and I are located on the unceded traditional territories of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples. And since this event is happening within the digital sphere, I want to acknowledge that folks are tuning in from across Northern Turtle Island. And I ask you to take a moment now to recognize the lands on which you're based. At the CCGSD, we stand by all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples and extend our respect for their invaluable past, present and future contributions to this land. As an organization guided by the principles of diversity, intersectional feminism and education, we work to teach about social justice, including indigenous people's resiliency in the face of ongoing structural violence and marginalization. We support ongoing efforts for indigenous self-determination, sovereignty, safety, food and water security. We recognize how vital representation is as part of the decolonizing mission and we ask settlers to evaluate and understand the differences between meaningful and true representation versus appropriation and tokenization of Indigenous communities. We encourage you to learn more by listening to Indigenous voices directly and carefully considering how to be thoughtful allies. If you aren't familiar with CCGSD, we are a national non-for-profit organization and we work to empower 2SLGBTQ plus youth and young adults through education, research and advocacy. Our guiding principle of activism through education informs all of our work toward building an understanding of and eliminating discrimination in all forms. We're very pleased to be organizing this event today with the Anti-69 Network, as well as activist scholars, Patrizia Gentile, Tom Hooper and Gary Kinsman. Anti-69 provides a forum for scholarly and activist work, critical of the mythologies and limitations of the 1969 criminal code reform. Although focused on the criminal code, Anti-69 looks at the reform and the struggles around it in its broader social, historical, colonial, class, racialized, gendered, and sexualized contexts. For more information about either of the organizations, you can take a look at some of the links we've dropped in the chat and there'll be some more to come towards the end too. Um, all right, so the focus of the event today is We Demand, and we're really excited to be hosting this event during Ottawa Pride Week um, and on the day before the 50th anniversary of We Demand tomorrow. First held on August 28th, 1971, We Demand was a protest organized by the Toronto Gay Action and the August 28th Day Committee, and it's widely remembered as one of the very first queer mobilizations. The protest came just two years after changes to the criminal code in 1969 that many have claimed as the decriminalization of homosexuality in Canada. However, this was certainly not the case as queer people were continuously discriminated against and criminalized in various ways. Protesters at We Demand in 1971 read aloud 10 demands on Parliament Hill that set the tone for queer activism to come. Ahead of this 50th anniversary, we've invited four incredible activist scholars to speak with us today um, and discuss We Demand, its legacy, commemoration, um, and more in conversation with the themes of queer resistance and activism that will hopefully draw us into a conversation that's still relevant today and very important today. There's been a slight change to our panelists. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Gary Kinsman couldn't speak today. So Dr. Patricia Gentile will be stepping in um, and I'll be saying a bit more about the panelists before some logistical information. So Dr. Patricia Gentile, our first panelist is an associate professor at Carleton University. She's the co-author of the Canadian War on Queers with Gary Kinsman 
She's also co-edited two books, including We Still Demand, Redefining Resistance and Sex, and Gender Struggles. Her current book is titled Queen of the Maple Leaf, Beauty Contests and Settler Femininity. Dr. Gentile will provide some historical context of the We Demand protest, including reference to the action as a protest against the 1969 Omnibus Bill. She'll also offer commentary on how the politics of erasure is used to entrench and center whiteness in the ways we remember the queer past. Dr. Laura Hall, another one of our panelists, is a scholar who focuses on intersectional indigenous independence, settler colonial studies and cultural production, land return, and ending violence against indigenous women and 2SLGBT communities. The daughter of a Mohawk mother and English Canadian father, Laura was raised on Anishinaabe territory in Meswakmuk, Sudbury. Laura will be talking about the centrality of Indigenous rights to queer rights, the roots of settler homonationalism, and addressing the calls to action from the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Our next panelist, Dr. Cassandra Lord, is an Assistant Professor of Sexuality Studies in the Department of Historical Studies, Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Program at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Dr. Lord poses the following question in relation to her talk. When we look back historically at the We Demand letter, what narratives are missing from this discussion? Dr. Lord will be emphasizing how it's important to think about queer, racialized, and two-spirited Indigenous people who are also organizing at that time against racism and homophobia, and that historical narratives need to be opened up and re-examined. Finally, River Rossi is a white settler PhD student in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Carleton University. Their past work has examined intersections of disability and AIDS activism in Canada, intergenerational knowledge transmission in queer and trans social movements, disability and criminalization, and queer phenomenology. Their doctoral research expands on their work with the Anti-69 Network by examining the Canadian state formation's regulation of sexuality and sites of resistance to it that challenge hegemonic organizing structures of whiteness, ableism, neuroableism, sanism, moral citizenship, and national belonging. More broadly, their research resides in the fields of critical disability studies, MAD studies, critical trans studies, queer sexuality studies, critical autism studies, and social philosophy. River's talk will discuss how Capital Pride's commemoration of the 1971 We Demand protests overlooks the ongoing exclusion of disability by gay rights organizations. They assert that activist demands of the past, present, and future must reflect on how radical disability politics contain abolitionist practices and values that are essential to everyone's liberation, yet will always remain impossible to enact in state and corporate-sponsored Pride TM events. We're delighted to be joined by these four panelists and very excited to hear them speak to this important moment in history. Um, each panelist will be speaking for around 10 to 15 minutes um, and the entire event today will run around an hour and a half ending around 2.30. Um, we will be working our very best to stay within this time frame. However, we don't wanna interrupt or cut off any of our panelists discussions. So there is a possibility of ending slightly later than anticipated. Um, if you do need to leave at any time, please don't worry about it. This event is being recorded and will be made available after the fact um, on CCGSD's website and YouTube. After the panelists have spoken, we'll dive into a joint Q&A section and questions you have for select or all panelists can be posed through the Q&A feature down below. Um, it's to the right of my screen, hopefully for you as well. Um, and you're welcome to put your questions in there at the end. We'd also like to take a moment to remind folks to please be mindful and respectful when submitting any questions or comments. Um, no abusive or discriminatory behavior will be tolerated and will be grounds for removal from this event. Thank you in advance to all of you for helping us build an inclusive learning environment today. So without <laughs> further ado, um, we'll hand the mic over to Dr. Gentile who will be giving us some background on We Demand um, as well as the 1969 criminal code reform. So Dr. Gentile, when you're ready, feel free to get started. And thank you again, everyone for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, first, happy pride, everybody, um, to my fellow panelists and 
um, to all of you attending. Thank you for coming to this uh, event. I want to take an opportunity to thank um, the CCGSD, especially Debbie and Emma, but I know that there was a crowd of people behind this uh, facilitating, coordinating, and, and making sure that this event takes place. And I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, truly. Um, thank you. I also like to thank the um, Anti-69 Network, um, as well as uh, my colleagues, Tom and, and Gary, but also Stephen Maynard, who was uh, with us uh, at the beginning as well. I also um, I wanted to thank uh, my panelists, uh, my fellow panelists for, for joining. And I'm uh, so excited about having this chance to to spend some time uh, and some space with you today. So I'll, I, I wrote some comments, hopefully, uh, they're really just made, uh, you know, I, I designed them just to basically create a little bit of a um, context uh, and they're very brief. Uh, there's two parts to my comments today and I, won't, I don't have the time because of time constraints to give you a concise, so-called concise history of the August uh, 28, 19, um, uh, 71 action uh, that we're talking about today, but I, I do have two things. Uh, there's two parts to what I want to talk about today. First, I want to sort of talk about some details that don't get circulated um, uh, about the event, I don't think, are as popularly circulated or as known, um, but I think might help with, um, you know, some of the, 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 the issues and the, the topics that we're going to hear from, from the the panelists who, who, who uh, are going to go deeper, dwell deeper into these, to, to the issues. Um, and secondly, I, I wanted my comments, the second part of my comments are going to talk about, you know, what, what is often called the politics of erasure and, and this connection to uh, queer archives or the making of, 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 or thinking how we think about the queer past, which Cassandra, of course, is going to really <laughs> dig deep into uh, in her comments. Um, so the first one actually, and, and Emma mentioned this in her introductory uh, comments, uh, is the first detail I think that most people don't know about, and I think it's really important for us to remember because uh, of, of how we think about resistance, and that is that the We Demand Action was very much a protest against what is called Bill C-150, which we all know as the omnibus bill. Um, and I want to return back to this particular detail in the second part of my uh, comments today when I talk about the politics of erasure. So let's just bracket that for a minute. The second detail I think is also important for all of us to remember, uh, you know, at least a detail that doesn't get circulated as much is that the action that happened in Ottawa uh, was in 1971 uh, was, uh, there was another action that happened in Vancouver in solidarity with the Ottawa action uh, by the Gay Alliance towards um, equality uh, in Vancouver. And that action took place in front of the courthouse in that city. The third detail I thought was interesting for us to, to think about as well is that the Herb Spears, um, who died in 2011, was a founding member of the group that organized the Ottawa Action, which Emma also mentioned, which is called Toronto Gay Action. Um, and he was supposed to be the speaker, the main speaker at this event. But apparently he was in a car accident en route to the, to the event. So I don't think a lot of people know about that. As a result, Charlie Hill, who is the person that we often uh, you know, see photographs of giving the the famous speech under an umbrella because it was raining. Everybody knows it was raining that day. Um, and that was a Sunday, by the way. Um, it's, so sort of delivering the famous speech, but that speech was penned by another activist named David Newcomb mm -hmm. and Herb Spears. There were other speakers um, at this um, uh, Ottawa event that we call now the We Demand Action. And that was George Hislop, Pat Murphy, Pierre Masson and John Williams, who was an activist from the States who was uh, in, in Canada at the time. Uh, if people want to uh, see a, a color, a, in color version of Charlie Hill giving the speech, um, I can put in the chat at the end, uh, the clip that is actually part of the CBC digital archive. So it is possible to see uh, it, you know, the, the speech being delivered from the time. 
Um, the fourth detail I wanted to put out there in terms of contextualizing the history of the Wu demand action is that uh, the demands were based on a 13 page brief, uh, which was accompanied by a cover letter signed by key members of the Toronto Gay Action, uh, including um, uh, uh, Brian Waite and of course, Sherry DeNovo, which we have interviewed as part of this event. Um, so that's really important to remember uh, in terms of uh, uh, going further because both of these um, activists, Brian and Sherry, were also then quite key in, in, in the gay liberation uh, movement in terms of moving towards a human rights strategy. The fifth uh, detail that I wanna uh, put out there as part of the contextualization is that this brief, which by the way, I can also put a link in the chat um, that would, gives you access to the entire brief, which comes from the Toronto archives, um, uh, lists the organizations that endorse the actions and the demand, the action itself and the demands. These um, organizations included, and I wanna list them here, and I know it's gonna take a little time, but it's important for, for me to list them for you. The Community Homophile Association of Toronto, Front Liberation Homosexuelle, which is the Montreal Liberation Group, uh, GATE, which we've already encountered, uh, University of Guelph Homophile Association, University of Western Ontario Homophile Association, University of Toronto Homophile Association, Vancouver Gay Activist Alliance, Vancouver Gay Liberation Front, Gay Sisters Bookstore, University of Waterloo Gay Liberation Movement, and the York University Homophile Association. I wanted to name these organizations because we know now that they were under intense RCUP surveillance making demand eight, number eight of the demands, even more prescient, but also to show that while the We Demand action was not a national event, we can uh, demonstrate through this uh, list that in fact, the mobilization between different groups was already established by 1971. So there, we already have very, on, we're already on our way to having a, a mobilization of different uh, uh, queer organizations working together in coalition. Now, I do also want to emphasize that if you if you listen to this list that I, I read out, which is included in the brief in the cover letter, um, you'll see that, of course, these are all emphasized, really mostly emphasized in universities. So that could tell us, tells us something about class and race in terms of who these activists are, which is also something we're going to come back to, I'm sure, in terms of the panelists today, but also in terms of some of my briefer comments when I talk about the politics of erasure. Um, this coordination between different uh, homophile associations and, and uh, gay alliances and so on and so forth uh, was seen as a major political problem for the government who orchestrated the anti-queer campaign against these groups, partly because of their association with Marxist and leftist groups such as the League of Socialist Action. So of course, Gary and I, as uh, you may or may not know, have, have sort of documented a little bit of this history in um, the, the Canadian War on Queers. Um, but another part of the detail in terms of this, this section of my details is that the action itself, the We Demand protest itself was under surveillance. And we have documents that in fact, that document is just in my basement that shows the report of the RCMP agents, uh, officers who were reporting and doing surveillance on people like Charlie Hill and Pat Murphy as they were doing this demonstration. So the sixth detail I'd like us um, to, to remember in terms of contextualization is that the cover letter accompanying the brief begins with recognizing that despite the criminal code amendment that's part of the omnibus bill, which made sexual acts between two consenting quote unquote adults private uh, as, as uh, it was not seen as illegal that this, these sexual acts in private, as long as they were happening in private between consenting adults was not considered illegal, that it was, was and this is a quote from their cover letter, widely, widely misunderstood as legalizing homosexuality. So in 1971, it, the, the activists of the Toronto Gay Action were ready very much on um, 
the, the resisting and protesting the idea that the omnibus, omnibus bill, excuse me, was not um, uh, uh, legalizing homosexuality. Of course, this led them to pen demands number one and two, where they insist on the removal of gross indecency and decent act from the criminal code, where they insist that this removal take place. Uh, as well as the linking of gross indecency and buggery with a category that existed at the time called dangerous sexual offender and another category on, on vagrancy. This last point brings me uh, to a second point. Just let me, this is sort of the last, that was the last important historical point I wanted us to remember or detail. So we can see from this onset that despite this, the, you know, us all believing that homosexuality was decriminalized in our, in our country, um, the, the activists at the time really knew that in fact that was not the case and it was not the case for a very, very long time. And insisting that the, the con continuing to have gross indecency or uh, indecent acts as part of the criminal code in a sense canceled and even uh, eliminated any kind of fictitious or facade about the so-called uh, decriminalization of homosexuality. So in the second uh, part of my talk, uh, I want to sort of jump on and, and sort of continue to riff off this last point um, uh, and, and talk about how the politics of erasure shape how we research, document, and remember uh, our past and our histories. Uh, so briefly, I want to offer two insights, uh, because that's my role here on, <laughs> on the panel today, is just to give you some, some, some like broad strokes um, about how the politics of, erase, of uh, erasure get weaponized. So the first thing I wanna say about this weaponization is that queer historians like me um, or historians who write about the queer past have a very long history of centering whiteness in the archive of which I'm also part of. We do this using different strategies but for the most part, it often takes the shape of publishing research that highlights events and groups organized by queer, white queer activists that are not part, for instance, of the leather community or the drag community or sex worker communities. However, without these historically invisible communities, there would be no gay and lesbian liberation movement to speak of. The leather, drag and sex community, sex worker communities were actually quite central to the making of what we all now call the gay and les lesbian liberation movement. Uh, whether we're talking about in the Canadian context or what we call Canada or the US context, right? Uh, or even the UK, for instance, uh, and France and so on, for the European context. So, so without these, but we often don't, they often, these communities don't get included in those histories uh, that are published um, about what we understand as queer history. Uh, and I'm using the idea of queer history here uh, very purposely. Uh, we will hear remarks today that will highlight the erasure of other communities, including two spirit, black, trans and dis disabled communities, and now how they are hidden in, the, in this queer, white, cisgendered archive I am invoking today. But please note that scholars such as Ronaldo Walcott, Cassandra Lord, who's with us today, Beverly Baines, uh, Cyrus Marcus Ware, and I'm just, these are only just four examples, um, have written about this very issue extensively and for a long time. This is not an original idea that's coming out of mouths like people like me. They, these scholars have been written about it, have been writing about this idea of the politics of erasure for a very long time. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we need to seriously interrogate, for example, the we behind the we demand. Uh, that we're talking about today, the very documented and historical event, even if it means displacing memories of activists who, conti who continue to fight for our communities. We need to displace what gets counted as so-called important events, even the We Demand action we're talking about today, just because it was the first of its kind. When we insist on spotlighting histories that emphasize gay and lesbian liberation actions, we solidify that, get, uh, that we're led by white, cisgender and uh, queer activists. We solidify the erasure of, his, of historically silenced communities by maintaining 
that these events are the legitimate archives and therefore worthy of study. So I, I know that um, my fellow panelists will talk more about this. So this is just a brief uh, part one of my two insights on the politics of erasure. The second um, very brief um, comment I wanna make about the politics of erasure uh, and, and is, uh, is related to how the state this time, not historians, but how the state co-op, the white queer archive, the cisgendered archive that I'm talking about and manipulates it to push forward uh, what is called often a homo, homo nationalist agenda, right? So the pinkwashing and the association of gay rights as human rights and therefore somehow absolving uh, Western or global North uh, uh, countries from the, from and being able to argue that they have somehow a cleaner record of human rights. This is a very simplified uh, explanation of homo nationalism, but it's just to get us thinking about what I mean by homo nationalism. Here I want to return to the Toronto Gay Action, uh, this group that organized the We Demand, uh, especially their, their demands in brief um, it, and, and, and their recognition of homosexuality uh, as not being decriminalized in 1969 uh, with the passing of the omnibus bill. Th the state now weaponizes different strategies to perpetuate the politics of erasure in regards to the queer past, even in regards to this issue of the, whether uh, homosexuality was decriminalized or not, right? They weapon it. They actually have succeeded in creating an entire discourse that in fact was that, that homosexuality was decriminalized when we know that it wasn't. When we know that even the, the, the protesters and the activists at the time could recognize that it wasn't decriminalized. Um, but they use other, but the state uses other um, strategies to weaponize this politics of erasure. Uh, and I wanna give you some other examples here, not just the fact that there's this understanding that gets circulated that ho somehow homosexuality was decriminalized in, in, in 1969. They use, for example, when they, uh, they one weapon they use it is by uh, uh, launching a commemorative coin uh, at the 50th anniversary of the, um, the 1969 um, so-called decriminalization of homosexuality, which my colleagues, Tom Hooper and Stephen Maynard and Gary Kisman have written about. So you, can, you look, can look up more about the critiques of this coin. Uh, by issuing an apology, which Emma actually this morning in the CBC uh, interview talked about, issuing the apology against these anti-purge, um, anti-queer purges, but have, you know, putting no money into dealing, for example, uh, around trans youth and um, housing. Um, or, for example, another example by, uh, that I want to mention is that the mounting of a multi-million dollar bidding process to build a monument to mark the anti-queer purge campaign uh, in the name of not forgetting the dark chapter. This is often used, right? This idea of we need to make sure we're not forgetting the dark chapter in Canadian history, which, by the way, is a discourse in step with weaponizing the politics of erasure and the colonial violence it draws on. Um, together, the, what I'm trying to argue here around the, the state and its co-optation is that together these examples ensure that the heterosexual, heterosexist and homonationalist version of the queer past is concretized. You know, figuratively and literally, <laughs> these monuments will be a concretization of this politics of erasure while keeping the histories of sex work worker trans disability and biopop communities buried, hidden and invisible. So just, you know, I, I, there's a lot more I can say and I'm hoping that in our discussion, uh, we, we can, you know, revisit some of these issues. And I know that um, it, it, Cassandra and, and, and the others, uh, River and Laura will also talk about this, but there's only one last thing I do wanna say is that, and this is a weird thing, you know, it's, it's very strange coming from a historian uh, uh, mouth because, I trained as a historian um, is that I think that going one way that we can go forward as a community or as, you know as, as members of different communities is not to worry as much uh, when we're talking about these so-called important events 
uh, especially when we're talking about the white cis gender queer um, archives about what the younger generation will remember. And we should start actually worrying more about practicing a future in the present that is based on ensuring that the, the stories that have been hidden and buried and made invisible actually are recovered and brought to the forefront. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gentile, for your talk, for starting us off today. Um, this is already a great start. Excited to hear more from the panelists. Um, next up will be Dr. Laura Hall discussing um, the centrality of Indigenous rights to queer rights and more. So um, welcome, Dr. Hall, and feel free to get started when, when you're ready. <laughs> Or I should maybe I should have looked at an agenda to see um, what number I was. Uh, I, I'm just I, I'm going to warn everyone in advance. I have um, two lovely brand new twins, um, and they may cry in the background, and I'll be distracted. And also, I don't sleep anymore, so things are a little uh, disorganized. Uh, in my brain right now. Um, I just have a few things to say. So I've been thinking about the we demand uh, moment and I've been thinking about other moments and <clears throat> I've been thinking about the moment as a, just a, a, a kind of a, a moment of understanding um, the structure of settler colonialism and understanding how settler homo nationalism <clears throat> perpetuates itself. And uh, my use of, of settler homo nationalism uh, you know, refers back to uh, particularly the later items in the We Demand um, list, uh, inclusion in the military, um, inclusion in government. Um, and so seeing uh, those as, as sort of overarching goals in an, in, an, in an activist moment, what does that mean for us now talking about, um, talking about these things now? Um, and so I, I want to think about, um, you know, the definition of settler colonialism and, and again, understanding that with, we are also, you know, indigenous study, study scholars are trying to engage with that settler colonial studies to say, look, like indigenous studies originated a lot of this. We don't need to um, kind of park everything in settler colonial studies. I'm putting that just aside for just a second. Uh, Patrick Wolf's understanding of settler colonialism um, in terms of the elimination of the indigenous person and the replacement of indigenous people uh, by settlers is, is, is still the, the, the structure of the problem. Um, and then from there, um, how does that, uh, that, that aim of replacement, that structure of replacement start to shape uh, badly, um, activist movements like um, the We Demand and other moments. Um, and so this, this, I just want to read this quote from Mark Rifkin about that concept, that mount, that shaping. Um, on, uh, in Settler Common Sense, Mark Rifkin says, when and how do projects of elimination, replacement, and possession, possession of land, become geographies of everyday non-native occupancy that do not understand themselves as predicated on colonial occupation or on a history of settler indigenous relations. So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of moment to understand a, a, this shaping. Um, it's not about uh, necessarily, it's, it's a moment also to remind ourselves that, that tokenizing of indigenous queer perspectives, two-spirit perspectives, um that 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 there's a there's you know an obvious need to move beyond that tokenizing um as environmental change starts to actually affect white settlers uh and and they become extremely concerned about things that indigenous and black communities have been ex extremely concerned about for a very long time because of an extractive economy um that extracts uh from land as well as from families. Um, and that I wanna give credit to Celeste uh, Pedri Spade for reminding us um, in indigenous studies that that extractive economy is also about our families. Um, so understanding this moment, understanding uh, the basis of a movement, 
or a movement based on liberal inclusion and individualism, um, I always come to, okay, well, how do I take that moment and make it about um, the, the, the real urgency of indigenous rights, indigenous land rights and indigenous human rights? Reminder, of course, that um, indigenous people, uh, at least according to the Friendship Center movement, are made up of um, at least 80% uh, urban people that uh, for non-Indigenous people, often the conversation is about uh, First Nations rights and, and um, not a, a non-understanding of, uh, you know, none of the land was ceded and we want it all back. Um, so whatever, we can't, we can talk about what that means and do we want the land back or are we returning to our own lands? There's also that conversation. Um, and so the moment, of course, in, in 2000, in the summer of 2019, I don't think I'm getting my years wrong, um, when the, the 69 celebrations were happening, um, it was the same summer that the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women, um, their findings fell with, I would say, a, a great deal, a, kind of a thud for the mainstream, um, but for Indigenous people, a great deal of grief. Um, and, and, and caught up as we often are in cycles of grief because the dailiness of settler colonialism is erased um, in a daily way. And so that summer of attempting to, you know, the state was attempting to celebrate its, uh, its human rights past, its human rights accomplishments. And we were, um, we were uh, attempting to get both state and non-Indigenous settlers to think about uh, ways that we could resist our own eradication um, uh, through uh, things, I mean, through economic repatriation, through land repatriation, and through um, supporting our kinship networks as well, which is why I, I, I remind everyone that, you know, um, Two-spirit activism and indigenous feminism reminds us that our family systems needed to be undone for the colonial system to thrive. And that undoing is continuous. It began with missionaries, it continued with residential schools and it continues with um, child apprehension systems. So it's not a moment, um, you know, of course, Wolf says settler colonialism is not an event. It's not a series of events, it's a system. So. Um, it's it's also about sort of that that reminder, um, and again, like uh, you know, how how does this conversation? You know, it, we need to re we need to center indigenous feminist and two spirit analysis. We need to look at um, the solutions that our people continually bring forward, solutions that are 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 good for everyone, but we shouldn't have to say that. Um, and again, I kind of want to reemphasize that our kinship, our land, and our economic systems need to be repatriated. And that's kind of uh, that's that's all the the antithesis of this sort of liberal um, settler colonial citizenship moment that we demand represents. Um, so that's really all I had to say. I'm I don't think I covered my notes, but uh, I'm open to questions and. Um, I think I can think through if questions are aimed at me. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall. Um, a very necessary, important discussion. Um, and yes, there will be time for, for some questions at the end. So if you folks have any, feel free to jot them down and include them later in the Q&A chat. Um, I'll also be dropping in a few links that Pat mentioned or Dr. Gentile mentioned earlier, um, some links around background information to We Demand. Um, and next up, our, our incoming panelist is uh, Dr. R. Cassandra Lord, who, um, sorry, <laughs> just a moment, who will be discussing the lack of representation of two-spirit and queer racialized folks and how this history needs re-examining today. Um, so over to you, Dr. Lord. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. I did a bit of changing of my topic a little bit, so I hope it fits in with the discussion today. 
Um, so I enter into the discussion as a scholar of sexuality studies and women and gender studies who is invested in thinking critically about the formation of queer historical narratives, specifically how such narratives get framed and inform the present. I'm also interested in rereading queer narratives alongside other moments which may not be visible. If we follow scholars who ask us to take the We Demand Brief as a form of resistance and challenge to the 1969 amendments, what the amendments did and did not do, how might we also look at the amendments alongside multiculturalism? And I kind of use that in terms of diversity, policies as framing a discourse around present day pride. <clears throat> I'm referring here not only to the annual Pride event, but also to Pride Toronto, the organization that hosts the annual Toronto Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and Queer, LGBTQ Pride Parade. From a discussion today, I'm, I use the two, uh, two entry points for consideration. Pride Toronto's 30th anniversary promotional material, specifically a timeline on page 35 of that anniversary guide. And the anniversary guide is published um, annually. Uh, and, um, and also I look at their five-year strategic plan, which was created in 2002, setting out the organization's goal and framework. I wish to show um, that if we take these documents or these documents taken together, create a historical narrative of gay liberation in Canada that normativizes discourses on sexuality and belonging as white. How does pride get narrated as a sexual story that has little to do with race, that buttresses, that buttresses a Canadian narrative from which queer uh, diasporic people of color and indigenous people um, are absent. We know that state, that the state, that state acts and policies um, uh, are created in tandem and inform each other. So how can we bring a discussion of sexuality and race into the same frame? Scholars in the Canadian context have been critical of the whitening of queer history in Canada, the process by which queer archives archives celebrate white queers as historical subjects and erases the research organizing and activism of queer, trans, black, indigenous, and people of color. To unsell the whiteness of the Canadian nation and of pride history, I focus on Palau Masquerade, so it's spelled P-E-L-A-U, an organized self-identified Caribbean queer diaspora group that first brought the performance of Trinidad and Tobago's tradition of playing mass, which is dressing up in costumes and parading and dancing together um, as uh, people on the street. Um, and they brought this event to Pride, to participate in Pride, in the Pride Parade in 2002. The group was founded by Jamia Zuberi, a self-identified Black Trinidadian lesbian educator and community activist who worked for several years as a, or a social organizer within Black cultural communities and Black queer communities in Toronto. Kalau mobilizes under the umbrella of the Caribbean, differentiating itself as a space for queer people of color. The group is comprised of queer people of Caribbean heritage, as well as non-Caribbean queers from different racial and ethnic groups, um, as, such as Black, Filipino, Chinese, Indian, predominantly Indo-Caribbean, white mixed race people who hail from Canada, the Philippines, and different Caribbean islands in, um, and different islands in the Caribbean. The group encompasses differently gendered people who include both non-transgender women, as well as a smaller number of transgender people with a ratio of males to females being larger than females to males. All of the participants of Palau reflect a variety of sexual identities, which are not limited to butch dykes, femmes, les femme lesbians, bisexuals, heterosexuals, as well as young and older gay men. <clears throat> I suggest that Palau offers a way to make visible the emergence of how Pride in Toronto documents its struggle for rights in Canada, its official story of Pride, as a queer history that continues to be narrated, narrated in ways that deracialize queer subjects and invoke white gays and lesbians as central to its story, while marking queer diaspora people as, as having a best related, largely contingent relationship uh, to Pride. So I'm now gonna give um, two examples. And the first is uh, a reading of the Pride uh, timeline featured in the 30th anniversary official Pride Guide. And the second uh, example that I'm gonna bring up is more about how uh, diversity, uh, the, the language of diversity becomes deployed by, by Pride in of itself. 
Um, so in the anniversary guide, there, um, as every year where, uh, where Pride publishes it, it has a letter from the executive director thanking sponsors and supporters, a listing of photographs of Pride Toronto's board members, staff, committee members, a listing of the Pride events leading up to the event. And, um, and then I came upon this page 35 of the, uh, of, the, of the guide that is titled Pride Toronto 30 Years in the Making. Uh, in that, it's a timeline that's divided into four columns spanning four decades from the 1960s up until the 2000s. Each period of the timeline contains flashpoints beginning with the 1969 Stonewall riots. The statement on Stonewall in the timeline appears alongside the Canadian Liberal Justice Minister Pierre Trudeau, uh, Trudeau, Elliot Trudeau's move to usher in law reforms by decriminalizing homosexual acts for consenting adults over, age of, over the age of 21. So, um, and we know um, Professor Gentile and Professor Kinsman have talked about it's not partial or it's not a decriminalization in their works. Beginning with the Stonewall riot since, um, and decriminalization, the timeline, the Pride Toronto timeline foregrounds struggles against the state as framing the story of Canadian pride a story that is central to making white queers a minority in Canada, mobilizing over time for equal rights based on sexual orientation. And I must also kind of make note here too in, in my reading and rereading of that timeline, um, Two Spirit of the First Nations, which has been an active group for many, many years, are, are nowhere listed in that timeline. So, um, so although, although basically Stonewall that's featured prominently in the timeline at the beginning of the timeline um, is often depicted as an originary site, a universal moment for founding of the lesbian gay liberation movement and by extension, the birth of pride by positioning Stonewall as the first event in the timeline and it coming right before the, the language of decriminalization reveals how political organizing forces the hand of the state. What becomes evident in the timeline's representation is how a national political story of pride starts to take shape. One that um, denies, one that opens the door to the Canadian lesbian gay struggle for inclusion. Gay men and lesbians once denied full membership are given partial rights or, or some of them are able to claim a sexual citizenship. In particular, the criminal code amendments are cast a defining moment in the Canadian history where state sanctioned policy marks a moment where queer people are made visible through public discourse. These amendments are synonymous with Trudeau's well-known declaration, there's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation, a proclamation claimed at making Canada a just society, one in which everyone is equal regardless of one's sexual identity. Whiteness as a hegemonic racial norm continues to be at play even within institutions, structures of understandings that are ostensibly monetized. And this is um, uh, Roderick Ferguson's, um, I, I quote him here. To the extent that queer history becomes synonymous with white queer history, the radical and tra transformative potential of queer interventions becomes muted and end up reinforcing whiteness and white dominance instead of dismantling it. Now I, I turn to the second point that I wanna give as an example, which is a turn, um, a turn to diversity from erasure to belated re recognition. Uh, the language of diversity, and this is where I, I, when, I, um, when I think it's helpful to think about uh, how we need to go further back and look at how uh, the state is, the state kind of its formation, right? Um, so the languages of diversity becomes another way in which white queers are able to secure their position by the state. So, um, so in October 20, 20, 2002, Pride Toronto implemented a five-year strategic direction um, plan that was deleted, that was updated in 2004. Earlier that year, uh, Pride Toronto held a two-day strategic planning retreat where members of its board and committee uh, committee members participated and brainstormed. Uh, topics and issues that were meaningful to them, which included larger themes emphasizing the future direction of the organization. The five-year strategic plan 2002 booklet 
uh, which is a 12 page booklet became a central document used for setting up a number of key areas for daily operations and plans for addressing diversity within the organization. So I kind of looked at pages nine to 11, the main four of the book. And there were, there were three points uh, that I'm pulling out, like one of them in particular that caught my attention. So one of them was creating a better community event in terms of increasing, um, making space for different, for different groups, community groups and pride, increasing the involvement of women, addressing, addressing historical issues of the organization faced in attracting women um, and um, its com commitment to making women more visible in the promotion of the Dyke March and on their website and media uh, events. And then increasing ethno-cultural representation within Pride Toronto was uh, the third point in, in the book in terms of um, thinking about how the organization, and I quote here, Pride Toronto says, it needs to take proactive steps to engage these communities and facilitate their participation within the organization and the event, end quote. Um, so the, the, the strategic document proposed a kind of step-by-step -step approach to how they would look at uh, increasing ethno-racial diversity within Pride, uh, the organization, and within the event. So I read uh, Pride Toronto's strategic direction uh, as a concerted effort to make central areas, um, you know, like noting that they have any key areas that they need to actually attend to. But I, wanna, but I, as I said, I focus on the third point of the mandate because, um, in terms of the ethnocultural diversity, um, because um, as I quote here, Asama Ahmed talks about diversity stands, you know, becomes a code word for race, ethnicity, culture, um, and um, and as she also states here is that about uh, diversity, uh, the appeal for diversity for organizations is about looking good and feeling good through their documents and policies rather than doing the work of addressing racism. It also operates within the official logic of multiculturalism, um, state sanctioned policies that center on identity and culture as a way to appeal to racialized minorities. As Walcott notes, according to the logic of multiculturalism, it's used to promote diversity without addressing structural inequalities, which end up reinforcing whiteness as an unmarked standard. So the, the same year that, um, that the uh, 2002 booklet, um, the strategic direction plan that Pride uh, put forward, that's the year that Palau masquerade, Palau entered, um, entered the Pride event. Um, and I use um, Palau as a way to kind of think through one, how we can kind of go back and read the, long, the, larger, uh, the larger timeline of Pride about what's missing, but also, um, not only what's missing, but how we can kind of think about um, the way in which uh, ideas around diversity and multiculturalism becomes apparent or absent, and when do they come forward within the timeline. Um, so, in, so in my longer reading of what I do in terms of reading the, the timeline is I create an, an alternate timeline that actually is not to replace the other timeline, but really to invoke other kinds of other organizations that that go missing in the timeline. So the two spirit of first people of the first nations, there is nowhere in that timeline um, uh, in that, um, and, and I should say that the pride timeline, it's, uh, it's a timeline that actually moves towards a kind of a, a liberal notion of progress. So it starts at how far, like um, where we began to basically the end is about uh, gay liberation and freeing other countries from uh, sexual oppression, right? So, um, and also corporatization, which is very apparent in that timeline. Um, other, so I wanna also raise, uh, put forward other, uh, other organizations that, um, that, are, are, that, go, that go missing. So OLA, the Latin community group that was, has been you know, visible for many, many years. A, um, a, um, ACAS, Asians, um, um, the AIDS uh, coalition. Sorry, I'm just gonna look at my notes here. Um, let me just follow here. So I, I'll say, first of all, there is Block Arama in 1998, which is a, a pivotal moment of thinking about Black, the presence of Black, um, a Black group within Pride, but not in the Pride parade, but in the stationary spaces of Pride. Um, then you have, um, the Black AIDS Network in 1997, you have Desh Pardesh 1998 to 2001. Like where are they in terms of thinking over a 30 year period of 
of histories. And it's not, again, not just about um, rereading or inclusion that I want to think about. I want to think about how, as I say, this, the state, state formations, um, you know, as Professor Hall talks about too, the idea about the, 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 our connection to land as a settler, my connection to land, and, what, and how are we replacing, what does it mean? Right to for some to get recognized and others not to. Um, other groups such as the South Asian Gay Men, um, which is an, an act uh, which is there to the Black Coalition for AIDS Prevention, um, Gay Asians, the Gay Asians Project, uh, Gay Asians Toronto, uh, Glad uh, Gay and Lesbians of African Descent. Um, and, um, and many more organizations, because I see that no timeline is complete, right? So um, it's an offering that I do in my work as a way to kind of make visible other kinds of histories. Um, and I guess the, the, to, to, to segue to the point also around thinking through um, how is it then, how do we then kind of think about state policy, right? Because um, I noticed that in the we demand, and I'll end here by talking about in the we demand, they talk about immigration. Where, you know, uh, there's a line, there's a point in there about immigration, and they're talking about immigration in terms of, well, if, if um, it, you know, gay people are oppressed, and we need to kind of think about how um, and, and how making, you know, making it fair for gay people to enter into the context of Canada. But if we think about ideas about race and immigration, like where does that, where does that intersect? So the, the last point that I'll raise just as we, we go by, we go, um, just as I wanna end my, my quick uh, talk here, and we can talk, we can, you can ask me more questions in the, in the, in the Q and A, is to, is to think more here about how might amendments, uh, how might the amendments uh, look along, how might it work alongside multiculturalism policies, right? Like is, as a moment for us to rethink what, the redemand is doing, and how do we kind of gesture to larger discourses? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lord. I'm taking all kinds of notes. <laughs> um, so much important information being shared today. Um, I'll pass it along to our final panelist for today before the Q&A section. Um, so, River Rossi will be discussing today how Capital Pride's commemoration of the 1971 We Demand protest overlooks the ongoing exclusion of disability by gay rights organizations. Um, the floor is yours, River. Thank you so much. So my talks kind of changed since uh, I made that statement, but it still stands. I still agree with everything I said. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right in. Uh, queer liberation uh, cannot be reached without disability justice, yet none of the demands at the 1971 We Demand rally called for changes in the regulation of disabled queer sexualities. So this absence has reverberated into the present moment with the ongoing marginalization of disability justice in queer liberation movements. Um, so, in what follows, I kind of want to root uh, this absence of disability from the demands issued in 1971 in the absence of a disability lens in the 1969 criminal code reform. So this will paint a picture um, of the historical context surrounding the 1969 uh, criminal code reform and its implications for disabled queers. So with this context, um, I wanna consider the implications of this omission for the 1971 rally, which reinforced an absence of disability justice in calls for queer liberation. Um, this absence also persists in the lack of meaningful engagement of disability justice in the present day state sanctioned commemorations of key moments in the history of queer activism as we're like witnessing right now in Ottawa and every other pride. So I basically just wanna emphasize that radical disability politics can't be state sanctioned because disability justice is by necessity against criminalization and assimilation in all forms. And disability 
is bound to all relationships of struggle and resistance and liberation for everyone can't really be reached without it. So turning to uh, the 1969 criminal code reform, uh, most analyses of what was claimed to be the decriminalization of homosexuality stop at the decriminalization of consensual buggery. And this is in section 149. Um, between a husband and a wife or two, and, and only two adults um, over the age of 21 in private. Um, so looking further into the document, uh, this decriminalization came with clauses uh, that further regulated the sexuality of disabled queers by questioning their capacity to consent to and engage in sexual and erotic acts. Um, specifically, uh, the clauses read, uh, and this is a quote, uh, A, an act shall be deemed not to have been committed in private if it is committed in a public space, or if more than two persons take part or are present. And B, uh, a person shall be deemed not to consent to the commission of the act. And there's two points to this. The first is, if consent is extorted by force, threats, or fear of bodily harm, or is obtained by false and fraudulent uh, misrepresentations as to the nature and quality of the act. And this is where disability comes in, and it's the second point. And it's uh, if that person is, and the other party uh, to the commission of the act knows, or has good reason to believe that this person is feeble-minded, insane, or an idiot, or imbecile, end quote. Um, so I kind of want to pause here. Um, and think about how much context really matters. So consent shows up in Canadian legislation um, and it's not the same kind of consent that we see um, in various social movements or in leather dyke and BDSM spaces that take up consent as a vital practice for engaging in others in collectively self-determined and respectful ways. So, Rather, um, in this particular historical moment, consent is being utilized uh, by the Canadian state in ways that protect itself, its national ideals, particular citizens, and its uh, carceral institutions. So it was never designed to liberate or even remotely protect uh, people who the nation state continued to criminalize and oppress. So turning back to the legislative um, amendments in 1969, uh, by suggesting that some disabled queers are unable to consent to sexual acts on the basis of perceived, um, of a perceived lack of mental, intellectual, and cognitive capacity, these legislative amendments did not provide legal recognition that included disabled queers as actors who engaged in sexual and erotic, erotic uh, practices. So not to mention this restriction of sexual acts to the private sphere and to two people made sex inaccessible and illegal for disabled people who relied on third parties to engage in sexual and erotic acts. So this also undermined possibilities for self-determination and sexual agency. So in doing so, the criminalization of sex for some uh, disabled people also left many uh, vulnerable to institutional violence. It also created legal conditions where various uh, institutions could not really be held accountable for any violence uh, they committed against disabled people. So this was... Uh, an erasure that went unchallenged in the 10 demands like issued in 1971. Um, the 1969 amendments also perpetuated another harmful stereotype surrounding sex and disability. And this was through like the ongoing criminalization of the pathologized disabled homosexual in the figure, and Pat brought this up, I think, of the dangerous sexual offender. So this is referenced in section 76, and it's defined as the person who by his conduct in any sexual matter has shown a failure to control his sexual impulses, 
and who is likely to cause injury, pain, or other evil to any person through failure in the future to control his sexual impulses, end quote. That's on page 928 of the document. Um, yeah, so well, 1969 marked a moment where certain homosexuals were no longer legally associated with the figure of the dangerous sexual offender. Many others remained criminalized. So the figure itself functions alongside psychiatric classification systems where high uncontrollable sex drives continue to be a diagnostic symptom for many highly stigmatized mental illnesses and disabilities. And these are often overrepresented in the prison system. So presently, the figure continues to be taken up by uh, the right as justification for queerphobic and transphobic actions. So the inherent ableism of Canada's criminal code cannot uh, be understood outside of violent histories of eugenics, policing, anti-Blackness, genocide, and colonialism that are ongoing in Canada. So for example, uh, the clause that I mentioned at the beginning um, referenced the term feeble-mindedness. And this has historically been used throughout like Canada's history, not only to oppress mentally ill people, cognitively disabled people, or intellectually disabled people, but also to uphold sy like systemic racism, uh, settler colonialism, and classism by labeling any kind of difference outside of the white property-owning, monogamous, and abled citizen as threats to the status quo. So two years following the omnibus bill, disability remained outside the scope of demands made at the We Demand rally. Uh, for instance, the demands explicitly look at politics surrounding the age of consent, which was 21, um, but they ignored the erasure of some disabled queers, like sexual and erotic agency. So this oversight is one of many examples of why it is so crucial to interrogate moments uh, in queer activist histories um, and search for how uh, these histories are memorialized, what it is about these moments that is being memorialized and how. So these historical moments are examples of how normalized disability oppression is as well as the marginalization or outright exclusion of disability justice from how we understand queer liberation and sexual and erotic uh, desire more broadly. So presently we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the 1971 We Demand demonstration. However, there are still demands to be made uh, by and for disabled queers, um, queer liberation, can't be reduced to single issue activism. And this is a key contribution offered by a radical disability politics. And this is based off of organizer um, and scholar AJ Withers uh, work on radical access. Um, in it, they call for engaging in multi-issue organizing, resisting movement complicity and continuing the oppression of others and working towards um, liberation for everyone. So radical access, or sorry, radical disability politics um, is about nourishing difference and valuing the lives and experiences of those who at various points the Canadian nation state has oppressed. Um, it's a politics that acknowledges that state exclusions are always ongoing and necessarily entails abolitionist, anti-capitalist, anti-colonial practices that are not focused on fixing and assimilating into carceral systems and institutions as end goals. So drawing attention to the exclusion of disability from the 1969 criminal code reform and the 1971 We Demand rally as moments of queer liberation is so crucial, right? Because it shines a light on and challenges the exclusion um, of disability from dominant understandings of queer liberation. So it is necessary 
to politicize the ways that disability remains inadequately addressed and valued in spaces dedicated to liberation. And if nothing else, radical disability politics teach us uh, that solidarity across movements can create the conditions necessary to imagine and build possibilities for living beyond uh, the Canadian state and the various carceral institutions that sustain it. So I think I'm going to end there. But, yeah. Thank you so much, River. Um, again, such important discussion. Um, looking forward now to the Q&A. Um, Feel free to drop your questions in there um, into the, I suppose, either the chat or there is the Q&A function to the bottom right for um, any of the panelists. Um, and thank you again to all of the panelists for this, this incredible discussion, this necessary, this important reflection on this moment, um, especially given the time we're in right now. Um, so I'm just going to take a look over some of the, the chat. Um, and some questions. I've got a couple questions lined up too, um, just in case. And if any of the panelists have questions for um, each other too, you're welcome to do so. Um, but uh, I'm just going to take a quick second to, to look through some of the chat. Okay. Well, we while we wait for folks to maybe put in some some questions um, or comments, uh, I, I might ask of the panelists um, their perspective while we're discussing. Some of the absences and uh, Dr. Lord mentioned many of the um, community organizations involved. Um, I just wanted to ask a bit about the role of students and university campuses in this activism in these moments and in a lot of moments since um, and how how that linked perhaps to organizations um, that were operating within these intersections or otherwise and if you if you have any thoughts on that. Um, to any of the panelists, feel free to get started. I'm going to look over. We've just received another another question in the Q and A. Does anybody want to? We have also received another question yeah. that I can throw out if, if people okay. prefer. <laughs> um, so somebody's asked, and I think this links well in some ways to this discussion that that all of us have been ha that um, all the panelists have been having around the ways that we demand is a moment that's definitely continuing to present day and this idea of we still demand. So um, I suppose this would be best directed in some ways to River, but um, Sunny has asked, what are we looking, um, looking to change when it comes to disabled queer folks? How can we help? Um, that is a bit of a big question, but if you have any, any thoughts on that River, um, that would be, and I, I suppose we can even broaden that to understand like, how can we help many of the folks at the intersections of, of, uh, of queerness, including like Black, Indigenous, racialized queer folks, and what would their meaningful inclusion in all this um, begin to look like? So again, if there are any thoughts um, on that from the panelists, feel free to join in. Um, I, I, could I say something really quickly about that? Um, a few of us are working on a project right now, and uh, I, I've been talking uh, to the group about um, how much of the literature on disability and indigeneity um, is it, it, it speaks to the, the 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 things that the state does to um, to disable to uh, the the disabling effects of the state, and what I want to focus on as a kind of a, a, a shift is um, for the, the normalization, of course, of how um, our bodies and our minds and our emotions react to trauma. And for Indigenous women, for Black women, for Two-Spirit and queer folks of color, trauma is, 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 is daily and built into the system. Um, and so, uh, I also have wanted to shift the conversation to talk about surveillance and how um, our, uh, you know, there's been a great deal of, you know, there's been a lot of a, a sort of a push to recognize the disabling effects of the state without the, the, the real need to sort of look at how, okay, that push then encourages more surveillance. Um, and, and, you know, just very quickly as a, as a queer native person um, with multiple um, physical, emotional, spiritual, mental 
um, impacts uh, from the state uh, being in a hospital system and trying to get our children out of that hospital system um, just sort of reminded me that that these aren't these aren't again these aren't historical conversations um, and questions about my mental health were not aimed at at helping me with um, PTSD and postpartum they were aimed at um, encouraging me to to and, and, and surveying me and uh, and and placing me within even more state systems right um, and of course removing my children from me so that uh, as a personal example has come uh, is, is something that I'm thinking about so again sort of looking at to say taking that literature and kind of shifting it <clears throat> um, is something I'm thinking a lot about and of course the intersections between queerness disability and indigeneity um, and gender um, allyship as well between Black and Indigenous communities on these conversations is something that I'm I'm interested in uh, deepening as well. I just wanted to say that real quick. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Hall. Um, we've received quite quite a few more questions now. Um, I'm going to see if I can combine some of them in the interest of time. Um, but again, if any of the panelists would like to speak to a previous question, feel free feel free to do so. Um, so a few people are asking about um, legal reform and sort of the kind of current climate and context. Um, some folks are mentioning, for instance, um, entrenching um, trans, more trans rights in the Ontario Human Rights Code and are asking about current legal cases to consider. Um, and I think this ties in well in some ways to um, some folks as well commenting in the chat we are in the context of an election <laughs> um, as we speak. And so uh, I'll kind of broaden this in a way to ask panelists um, if there's sort of any topics on, or any cases, any um, legal considerations, again, to consider in the cl climate of this current moment of activism. Um, for interested folks, for folks in the community who wanna support, um, is there anything you, you might recommend? or I suppose draw attention to in any way. There was a recent legal case around, um, uh, and it's an immigration case that we're focused on, uh, that just came out maybe a couple, two months ago that focused on um, it, it, uh, a gay man who was coming to Canada and he was in a relationship with a straight woman. And the case was, and I'm sure it was, people have actually read this case that spoke about um, how, Immigration Canada is reading um, who, uh, like saying that basically the, the, the Immigration Canada it stated that basically um, that they could not be in a legitimate relationship because he was a gay man and he was seeking um, refuge in Canada. Meanwhile, they had actually declared as a, that they, were they were raising a child together and they had a child together. So I think it's more about like looking at contemporary. So I guess it kind of segues to, there's a question around how do we teach high school kids about um, about ways of reading things that are complicated, right? Looking at popular culture and looking at like uh, newspaper discourses can help kind of understand and tie back to more the the, the, the high level complicated under ways of understanding is it, uh, like we can kind of look at everyday examples um, and cases and things in the newspaper as a way to kind of link back to what does this mean in terms of um, what, what's happening on the ground. Um, and I guess the last question, uh, there was another question here that spoke about like, how do we, how do we, um, I, I, I don't think I, from the panelists that have engaged with it that we were um, kind of opposing the demand because it's, because as I stated in my paper, it is actually taking it as a, what, what did the reforms do and didn't do, right? And it, it's pushing us forward. Um, we're talking about like, what are some of the ways that we can look back and think about what was happening simultaneously. And I think as a, uh, as a researcher, my, I, like my my uh my research and what I aim to do is kind of look not to kind of push away right but to really think what are the discourses that are happening simultaneously that um that can inform and and help you know illuminate certain ideas I I I just want one of the things that I'm not sure it's a legal I mean there's are there are legal issues that I think we should be focusing on but I I don't want to bring attention to that I actually want to bring attention to something a little broader and that um, it kind of riffs off a little bit what Laura was saying, um, and this, this question of, of surveillance that, you know, when, when the, the, the state sort of, uh, you know, for instance, through its apology of the anti-queer campaigns, 
um, creates this idea that, oh, we, we've recognized the way surveillance, we've used surveillance and security techniques and logics to, um, to in oppressive ways against particularly marginalized communities like the queer community. Um, it sort of, it, it, it helps to actually distract um, uh, attention from, for, for example, not just the surveillance in terms of uh, uh, disabled people and, and, and what Laura was just briefly speaking to, but also, for example, the surveillance of land defenders and water protectors, right? So for me, in this particular, in the context of the election, uh, if, we, if we're going to take something away from, um, you know, what was happening around We Demand and, and how can we think about uh, the way they, you know, they constructed particular, particular critiques of the state, um, it's, it's, it's really that in, for, for me, this question of surveillance is really important as well in the context, because it's one way for us to enter this question of, well, who, who are the people being under surveillance now? How, how do these, um, you know, how, do, how, who, how are particular communities, in a sense, are being continued to be under surveillance in a way that uh, we're supposed to think is not being happening with queers and trans people, you know, people. Uh, in our country, so I think I, I, I again I, I think that that things get weaponized, you know, a particular way uh, that you know, I, and we we can actually use to try to to fight against it, right? Like it, it's not, uh, I, you know, it's not a um, uh, a futile <laughs> process to try to think about the election as not just this thing that's gonna happen whether we like it or not, but really a way for us to enter into conversation or force the state to, to, to enter into conversation with us around how it's using, for instance, just as an example, you know, certain surveillance and security logics in the way that Laura was talking about, but also in terms of other ways uh, related to the land um, and, 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 and gender and sexuality and race and disability and so on. Next. Thank you so much for uh, your insights, both uh, Dr. Lauren and Dr. Gentile. I'm just going through there. A couple more questions, ones just come in too. Um, um, so Tom Hooper has asked um, and ha has commented here, um, the speakers have referenced these problems with how queer history has been written, including 1969, We Demand and Pride Toronto. Are there things we can do to inspire a new generation of historians who will disturb and reshape queer history? Um, so are, do any of the panelists have any thoughts on that question? And we can see, uh, folks, you're welcome to put in a few more. We've still got some time to answer a few more questions if there are any. Would it be um, useful if each and every one of us sort of tried to answer or tried to speak a little bit to, to this so instead of just having, I think um, that, maybe I'll just take a turn. That'd um, be great. Yeah, if, if everyone um, is, is okay doing that, I'm, I'm happy that we can do a bit of a starting with me. Pop. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if, if someone would, would like to begin with, um, with, with this question, um, I'm happy to to kind of repeat it again, are there things we can do to inspire a new generation of historians who will disturb and reshape queer history? A really important uh, question, I think, for, uh, for many of the folks here who, who are academics and scholars and for myself, for instance, an aspiring historian. So um, yeah, if, there's, if any of you would like to begin, uh, I'll leave it to you to chime in. <laughs> And just quickly, I'll say, what are the methods that you're using? Are the methods that you're using are reproducing the same kinds of ways of looking? So what kinds of, like, how may in, um, in, uh, Indigenous scholarship uh, in a, as a framework kind of help kind of rejig how you're looking at it? Like, I know in my work, I use queer diaspora reading practices as a ways of reading, like how reading archives for, uh, you know, people's kind of investments and in how they understand ways of being, right? Or looking across different different sites. Um, are you using like critical race theory? Like, you know, things, tools that you don't normally use in, in, in mainstream queer scholarship, in historical scholarship. If, you're, if that's not your area, uh, use different tools because it will 
it will produce different, it will give you different ways of looking. And I think that you have to kind of shift the way that you look by using these different tools. Just one example. Yes, I, thank you so much, Dr. Lori. I think River, you've raised a hand. Feel free to feel free to, feel free to jump in. <laughs> yeah, I think even building on that, um, when I was thinking about my presentation, um, I got caught up in thinking about like the intention I wanted to put behind like what I was doing, um, because I think um, a lot of the times when you're doing historical work. Um, you can really lose focus on just thinking about like how to include more, right? Um, so like, for instance, if I were to like include more like mad history and like mad activist history in Canada, I would probably like contribute to like a more inclusion, liberal inclusion discourse. So I guess thinking about like intention and end goals um, is super important. Um, so an end goal can't just be about contributing like more white histories um, so that the state can like co-opt these histories and like fill a void for their diversity um, initiatives that they're really into right now. Um, but rather uh, thinking about like an end goal um, in contributing history in a way that um, seeks to provoke like anti-assimilationist politics maybe, and like uh, rather than like focus um, on end, like end goals that have um, a goal of like being included, I guess. Uh, yeah, I think that's kind of a half formed thought. Thank you so much, yeah. Oh, and I think Dr. Shantil will pop in. <laughs> and then um, af, um, Dr. Hall, if you feel uh, you, you'd like to answer as well, we'll go over to you and, and then we'll uh, see some closing words after after this. I oh, know, I just wanted to, uh, one, one because uh, um, uh, River and Cassandra have actually um, uh, offered a lot of sort of concrete ways. I think one of the other ways we might do that um, to answer Tom's question is, uh, to to actually um, question what might be seen as you know the sort of the gatekeepers of archives, uh, I just want to sort of return to this question of archives, in that you know you know how what, one of the things, for instance, that um, was uh, really interesting uh, to me is that I went to this uh, one sort of conference on, on the body politic, where, where the, the scholars who were sort of critiquing the archive of the body politic, which is sort of the gay and lesbian liberation movement newspaper, arguably uh, representing the gay and lesbian liberation movement, um, was this question of really interrogating the archive itself, like what do we mean by an archive? Um, so one way that we can inspire a future generation of uh, historians is to uh, give them sort of the, the tools to think about, you know, what do we mean by an archive, what gets understood as an archive, and how do we interrogate the archivists that are, you know, are, who are building archives as we speak, um, and always sort of keeping them um, thinking about intersectional um, uh, uh, subjectivities and, and, and sort of uh, um, experiences, right? So I think that, I mean, that, that to me feels like a, a, a way to sort of get us to inspire <laughs> and think about, um, uh, you know, different, different communities and, and their contributions. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hall, any thoughts on this? Anything you, you'd like to add? Um, well, I, I, you know, there was a, a period of time um, when I was sort of looking at there were different stories around Stonewall that were sort of coming up. And one of them was uh, supposed to have been produced, I think, by Ryan Murphy, and it was going to show white gay youth throwing stones and, and bricks. And then that got nixed, thankfully, because it was so stupid. Um, it was such a whitewash. And then um, a short while later, Drunk History came out with a Stonewall episode that I showed to my students 
um, because I thought it was just such a uh, <laughs> such an interesting take. Um, you know, to to make history. Obviously, now I'm not promoting, um, you know, substance abuse as part of storytelling. Um, but it was it was an attempt at, at reaching at, at reaching a new audience around a, this historical moment and who really, you know, caused the shit disturbances that that shifted things right. And then and then the the life and deaths of of of, of um, Marsha P. Johnson came out, and it, it struck me that the 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 murder the unsolved deliberately unsolved murder of of uh, a really extremely important um, black woman, um, trans person was not being covered in, in the way in the mainstream and in queer studies in ways that were really kind of getting at the issues, right? So there's these different vantage points. I went to New York and what ended up happening was we went to Stonewall and there was like a huge NRA float and there were all these uh, queer people dancing on top of it. And it was, you know, a National Rifle Association float. So I just had this moment of being like, okay, how do we revisit stories and how do we tell stories? And, and you know, I think what Dr. Lord is doing in, in, in sort of bringing back into light the people whose stories are erased from, from the conversation is, is something that's, that's just really important. Um, and then being, you know, that, that critical perspective, I do think that uh, there's a way, you know, it's not about trashing we demand, it's about saying that, uh, that this is another example. My students will often say, well, what, you know, when did indigenous, when did the issues we're talking about begin, whether it's gender-based violence or environmental degradation, and I'll say 1492, and we'll talk about 1492 in critical ways, and we'll talk about the pillars of colonization, slavery, and um, and xenophobia, and and we we need to keep talking about the ways that the things that are erased get erased, and then talking about them again. And so it is a it is a it, at times painful, but at times humorous, at times uh, resilient, at times not resilient, just very difficult. We just need to keep telling those stories and keep bringing those stories forward. Um, so that's, I don't think that's, I don't know if that's much of an answer, but um, very glad Ryan Murphy's movie was never made. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for uh, this perspective. It's again, I've been taking notes, some, some things for me to consider and for all of us to consider. Um, and uh, thank you all so much in general for this wonderful event, um, this very critical, important reflection. Um, a few thank yous ahead. I, I'd like to first thank our, our four panelists, Patricia Gentile, Laura Hall, our Cassandra Lord, and River Rossi for uh, taking time today to share their insights, their research, and their visions. Um, it's been inspiring. It's been informational um, listening to each one of you. And uh, on behalf of CCGSD and the Anti-69 Network, I'd like to extend uh, our deepest gratitude for, for you spending time with us today. Um, I'd also like to give a huge thanks to some of our partners and sponsors, Anti-69 Network, Patrizia Gentile, Tom Hooper, Gary Kinsman, and Fredrickson Pride. Um, thank you all for being here with us virtually today in the audience for your questions. Apologies, we couldn't get to, to all of them, um, but uh, thank you, thank you for submitting them. Thank you for listening, for your, your perspectives as well, um, and for engaging in this important conversation. Um, you can follow the CCGSD's work on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter um, to stay tuned about any other events such as this, as well as our queer history programming and educational resources. Um, I've dropped some links in the chat, but there'll be many more links um, such as these, as well as the links today and to the recording sent to you via email um, after the fact as well. Um, on our website, you can also find a link to donate to the organization and all donations go to supporting our work toward building more safe, inclusive and affirming learning spaces for all. Um, again, thank you all so much for joining us today um, for your perspectives, take care, be safe um, and keep demanding. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs>